everyone, and welcome back to our Classic Tales story time. I am Miss Libba, your narrator, here in the Cottrell Digital Studio at the Northeast Georgia History Center, and we are moving on to Chapter 4 today. Now, if you are just joining us, you can catch up with the first three chapters in our Part 1. You can find that in our Facebook Videos tab or on our YouTube channel. So just to catch you up, though, so far, we have finally met Miss Anne, <laughs> a very, uh, very talkative and imaginative, creative young girl who is an orphan and has mistakenly been sent to the Cuthbert household. Now, Marilla and Matthew Cuthbert, husband and wife, were hoping to get a boy of about uh, 11 or so to help them around their home, but they ended up with the young Anne. And at this point in the story, we don't know if they are going to send Anne back to the orphanage or if they are going to keep her and if she'll have a home. So I'm excited to find out with you. So here we go. So Anne has just spent the night at the Cuthbert's house and the plan is that they are going to resolve this issue with uh, a woman named Mrs. Spencer, who was the woman who uh, went to the orphanage to get Anne in the first place and was given the wrong information <laughs> originally. So Anne is going to wake up and we'll decide, and uh, Ms. the Cuthberts will decide what her fate is. So here we go, chapter four of Anne of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. Morning at Green Gables. It was broad daylight when Anne awoke and and sat up in bed, staring confusedly at the window, through which a flood of cheery sunshine was pouring, and outside of which something white and feathery waved across glimpses of blue sky. For a moment, she could not remember where she was. First came a delightful thrill, as of something very pleasant, then a horrible remembrance. This was Green Gables, and they didn't want her because she wasn't a boy. But it was morning, and yes, it was a cherry tree in full bloom outside of her window. With a bound, she was cut off of bed and across, she was cut of bed and across the floor. She pushed up the sash. It went up stiffly and creakily, as if it hadn't been opened for a long time, which was the case. And it stuck so tight that nothing was needed to hold it up. Anne dropped on her knees and gazed out into the June morning, her eyes glistening with delight. Oh, wasn't it beautiful? Wasn't it a lovely place? Suppose she wasn't really going to stay here. Suppose she wasn't really going to stay here. She would imagine she was. There was scope for imagination here. A huge cherry tree grew outside, so close that its boughs tapped against the house, and it was so thick-set with blossoms that hardly a leaf was to be seen. On both sides of the house was a big orchard, one of apple trees and one of cherry trees, also showered over with blossoms, and their grass was all sprinkled with dandelions. In the garden below were lilac trees purple with flowers, and their dizzily sweet fragrance drifted up to the window on the morning wind. Below the garden, a green field, lush with clover, sloped down to the hollow where the brook ran and where scores of white birches grew, upspringing airily out of an undergrowth su suggestive of delightful possibilities in ferns and mosses and woodsy things generally. Beyond it was a hill, green and feathery with spruce and fir. There was a gap in it where the gray gable end of the little house where she had seen from the other side of the lake of shining waters was visible. Off to the left were the big barns, and beyond them, away down over green, low-sloping fields, was a sparkling blue glimpse of sea. Anne's beauty-loving eyes lingered on it all, taking everything greedily in. She had looked on so many unlovely places in her life, poor child, but this was as lovely as anything she had ever dreamed. Just going to check in on our audio real quick, see if we're doing okay. All right, let's continue on this beautiful morning. She knelt there, lost to everything but the loveliness around her, until she was startled by a hand on her shoulder. Marilla had come in unheard by the small dreamer. 
It's time you were dressed, she said curtly. Marilla really did not know how to talk to a child, and her uncomfortable ignorance made her crisp and curt when she did not mean to be. <clears throat> Anne stood up and drew a long breath. Oh, isn't it wonderful, she said, waving her hand comprehensively at the good world outside. It's a big tree, said Marilla, and it blooms great, but the fruit don't amount to much, never, small and wormy. Oh, I don't mean just the tree. Of course, it's lovely. Yes, it's radiantly lovely. It blooms as if it meant, meant it, but I don't, but I meant everything. The garden and the orchard and the brook and the woods, the whole big dear world. Don't you feel as if you just love the world on a morning like this? And I can hear the brook laughing all the way up here. Have you ever noticed what cheerful things brooks are? They, they're always laughing, even in wintertime. I've heard them under the ice. I'm so glad there's a brook near Green Gables. Perhaps you think it doesn't make any difference to me when you're not going to keep me, but it does. I shall always like to remember that there is a brook at Green Gables, even if I never see it again. If there wasn't a brook, I'd be haunted by the uncomfortable feeling that there ought to be one. I'm not in the depths of despair this morning. I never can be in the morning. Isn't it a splendid thing that there are mornings? But I feel very sad. I've just been imagining that it was really me you wanted after all, and that I was to stay here forever and ever. It was a great comfort while it lasted. But the worst of imagining things is that the time comes when you have to stop, and that hurts. You'd better get dressed and come downstairs, and never mind your imaginings, said Marilla, as soon as she could get a word in edgewise. Breakfast is waiting. Wash your face and comb your hair. Leave the window up and turn your bedclothes back over the foot of the bed. Be as smart as you can. Anne could evidently be smart to some purpose, for she was downstairs in ten minutes' time, with her clothes neatly on, her hair brushed and braided, her face washed, and a comfortable consciousness pervading her soul that she had fulfilled all Marilla's requirements. As a matter of fact, however, she had forgotten to turn back the bedclothes. I'm pretty hungry this morning, she announced as she slipped into the chair Marilla placed for her. The world doesn't seem such a howling wilderness as it did last night. I'm so glad it's a sunshiny morning. But I like rainy mornings real well, too. All sorts of mornings are interesting, don't you think? You don't know what's going to happen through the day, and there's so much scope for imagination. But I'm glad it's not rainy today because it's easier to be cheerful and bear up under affliction on a sunshiny day. I feel that I have a good deal to bear up under. It's all very well to read about sorrows and imagine yourself living through them heroically, but it's not so nice when you really come to have them, is it? For pity's sake, take hold of your tongue, said Marilla. You talk entirely too much for a little girl. Thereupon, Anne held her tongue so obediently and thoroughly that her continued silence made Marilla rather nervous, as if in the presence of something not exactly natural. Matthew also held his tongue, but this at least was natural, so that the meal was a very silent one. As it progressed, Anne became more and more abstracted, eating mechanically, with her big eyes fixed unswervingly and unseeingly on the sky outside the window. This made Marilla more nervous than ever. She had an uncomfortable feeling that while this odd child's body might be there at the table, her spirit was far away in some remote, airy cloudland, borne aloft on the wings of imagination. Who would want such a child about the place? Yet. Matthew wished to keep her, of all unaccountable things. Marilla felt that he wanted it just as much this morning as he had the night before, and that he would go on wanting it. That was Matthew's way, take a whim into his head and cling to it with the most amazing silent persistency, a persistency ten times more potent and effectual in its very silence than if he had talked it out loud. When the meal was ended, Anne came out of her reverie and offered to wash the dishes. Can you wash dishes right? asked Marilla distrustfully. Pretty well. I'm better at looking after children, though. I've had so much experience at that. It's such a pity you haven't any here for me to look after. I don't feel as if I wanted any more children to look after than I've got at present. You're problem enough in all conscience. What's to be done with you, I don't know. 
Matthew is a ridiculous man. I think he's lovely, said Anne reproachfully. He is so very sympathetic. He didn't mind how much I talked. He seemed to like it. I felt that he was a kindred spirit as soon as I ever saw him. You're both queer enough, if that's what you mean by kin kindred spirits, said Marilla with a sniff. Yes, you may wash the dishes, take plenty of hot water, and be sure you dry them well. I've got enough to attend to this morning, for I'll have to drive over to White Sands in the afternoon and see Mrs. Spencer. You'll come with me, and we'll settle what's to be done with you. After you finish the dishes, go upstairs and make your bed. Anne washed the dishes deftly enough as Marilla, who kept a sharp eye on the process, discerned. Later on, she made her bed less successfully, for she had never learned the art of wrestling with a feather tick. But it was done somehow and smoothed down, and then Marilla, to get rid of her, told her she might go out of doors and amuse herself until dinner time. Anne flew to the door, face alight, eyes glowing. On the very threshold, she stopped short, wheeled about, came back, and sat down by the table, light and glow as effectually blotted out as if someone had clapped an extinguisher on her. What's the matter now? demanded Marilla. I don't dare go out, said Anne, in the tone of a martyr relinquishing all earthly joys. If I can't stay here, there is no use in my loving Green Gables. And if I go out there and get acquainted with all those trees and flowers and the orchard and the brook, I'll not be able to help loving it. It's hard enough now, so I won't make it any harder. I want to go out so much. Everything seems to be calling to me. Anne, Anne, come out to us. Anne, Anne, we want a playmate, but it's better not. There is no use in loving things if you have to be torn from them, them is there? And it's so hard to keep from loving things, isn't it? That's why I was so glad when I thought I was going to live here. I thought I'd have so many things to love and nothing to hinder me. But that brief dream is over. I am resigned to my fate now, so I don't think I'll go out for fear I'll get unresigned again. What is the name of that geranium on the windowsill, please? That's the ap apple-scented geranium. Oh, I, I don't mean that sort of name. I mean just a name you gave it yourself. Didn't you give it a name? May I give it one then? May I call it, let me see, Bonnie would do. May I call it Bonnie while I'm here? Oh, do let me. Goodness, I don't care. But where on earth is the sense in naming a geranium? Oh, I like to have handles, even if they are only geraniums. It makes them seem more like people. How do you know but that it hurts a geranium's feelings just to be called a geranium and nothing else? You wouldn't like to be called nothing but a woman all the time. Yes, I shall call it Bonnie. I named that cherry tree outside my bedroom window this morning. I called it Snow Queen because it was so white. Of course, it won't always be in blossom, but one can imagine that it is, can't one? I never in all my life saw or heard anything to equal her, muttered Marilla, beating a retreat down cellar after potatoes. She is kind of interesting, as Matthew says. I can feel already that I'm wondering what on earth she'll say next. She'll be casting a spell over me, too. She's cast it over Matthew. That look he gave me when he went out said everything he said or hinted last night over again. I wish he was like other men and would talk things out. A body could answer back then and argue him into reason. But what's to be done with a man who just looks? Anne had relapsed into reverie with her chin in her hands and her eyes on the sky when Marilla returned from her cellar pilgrimage. There Marilla left her until the early dinner was on the table. I suppose I can have the mare and buggy this afternoon, Matthew, said Marilla. Matthew nodded and looked wistfully at Anne. Marilla intercepted the look and said grimly, I'm going to drive over to White Sands and settle this thing. I'll take Anne with me and Mrs. Spencer will probably make arrangements to send her back to Nova Scotia at once. I'll set your tea out for you and I'll be home in time to milk the cows. Still, Matthew said nothing. And Marilla had a sense of having wasted words and breath. There is nothing more aggravating than a man who won't talk back, unless it is a woman who won't. <laughs> Matthew hitched the sorrel into the buggy in due time, and Marilla and Anne set off. Matthew opened the yard gate for them, and as they drove slowly through, he said, to nobody in particular as it seemed, Little Jerry Bolt from the creek was here this morning, and I told him I guessed I'd hire him for the summer. 
Marilla made no reply, but she hit the unlucky sorrel with such a vicious clip with the whip that the fat mare, unused, unused to such treatment, whizzed indignantly down the lane at an alarming pace. Marilla looked back once as the buggy bounced along and saw that aggravating Matthew leaning over the gate, looking wistfully after them. Checking in on our audio. All right, very good. Just going to get a sip of coffee. I do hope Marilla will turn around. We'll see. <laughs> Chapter 5, Anne's History. Do you know, said Anne confidently, confidentially, I've made up my mind to enjoy this drive. It's been my experience that you can nearly always enjoy things if you make up your mind firmly that you will. Of course, you must make it up firmly. I'm not going to think about going back to the asylum while we're having our drive. I'm just going to think about the drive. Oh, look, there's one little early wild rose out. Isn't it lovely? Don't you think it must be glad to be a rose? Wouldn't it be nice if roses could talk? I'm sure they could tell us such lovely things. And isn't pink the most bewitching color in the world? I love it, but I can't wear it. Red-headed people can't wear pink, not even in imagination. Did you ever know of anybody whose hair was red when she was young, but got to be another color when she grew up? No, I don't know as I ever did, said Mar Marilla mercilessly. <laughs> and I shouldn't think it likely to happen in your case either. Anne sighed. Well, that is another hope gone. My life is a perfect graveyard of buried hopes. That's a sentence I read in a book once, and I say it over to comfort myself when I'm disappointed in anything. I don't see where the comforting comes from, said Marilla. Why, because it sounds so nice and romantic, just as if I were a heroine in a book, you know. I am so fond of romantic things, and a graveyard full of buried hopes is about as romantic a thing as one can imagine, isn't it? I'm rather glad I have one. Are we going across the Lake of Shining Waters today? We're not going over Barry's Pond, if that's what you mean by your Lake of Shining Waters. We're going by the Shore Road. Shore Road sounds nice, said Anne dreamily. Is it as nice as it sounds? Just when you said Shore Road, I saw it in a picture in my mind, as quick as that. And White Sands is a pretty name too, but I don't like it as well as Avonlea. Avonlea is a lovely name. It just sounds like music. How far is it to White Sands? It's five miles, and as you're evidently bent on talking, you might as well talk to some purpose by telling me what you know about yourself. Oh, what I know about myself isn't really worth telling, said Anne eagerly. If you'll only let me tell you what I imagine about myself, you'll think it ever so much more interesting. No, I don't want any of your imaginings. Just you stick to bald facts. Begin at the beginning. Where were you born and how old are you? I was 11 last March, said Anne, resigning herself to bald facts with a little sigh. And I was born in, in Bolingbroke, Nova Scotia. My father's name was Walter Shirley, and he was a teacher in the Bolingbroke High School. My mother's name was Bertha Shirley. Aren't Walter and Bertha lovely names? I'm so glad my parents had nice names. It would be a real disgrace to have a father named, well, say, Jedediah, wouldn't it? I guess it doesn't matter what a person's name is as long as he behaves himself, said Marilla, feeling herself called upon to in inculcate a good and useful moral. Well, I don't know, Anne looked thoughtful. I read in a book once that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, but I've never been able to believe it. I don't believe a rose would be as nice if it were called a thistle or a skunk cabbage. I suppose my father could have been a good na man even if he had been called Jedediah, but I'm sure it would have been a cross. Well, my mother was a teacher in the high school too, but when she married, father gave up uh, teaching, of course. A husband was enough responsibility. Mrs. Thomas said that they were a pair of babies, that there were, they were a pair of babies and as poor as church mice. They went to live in a weeny teeny little yellow house in Bolingbroke. Broke. I've never seen that house, but I've imagined it a thousand times. I think it must have had honeysuckle over the parlor window and lilacs in the front yard and lilies of the valley just inside the gate. Yes, and muslin curtains in all the windows. Muslin curtains give a house such an air. I was born in that house. Mrs. Thomas said I was the homeliest baby she ever saw. I was so scrawny and tiny and nothing but eyes, but 
that mother thought I was perfectly beautiful. I should think a mother would be a better judge than a poor woman who came in to scrub, wouldn't you? I'm glad she was satisfied with me anyhow. I would feel so sad if I thought I was a disappointment to her, because she didn't live very long after that, you see. She died of fever when I was just three months old. I do wish she'd live long enough for me to remember calling her mother. I think it would be so sweet to say, mother, don't you? And father died four days afterward from fever, too. That left me an orphan, and folks were at their wits' end, so Miss Thomas said, what to do with me? You see, nobody wanted me even then. It seems to be my fate. Father and mother had both come from places far away, and it was well known they hadn't any relatives living. Finally, Mrs. Thomas said she'd take me, though she was poor and had a drunken husband. She brought me up by hand. Do you know if there is anything in being brought up by hand that ought to make people who are brought up that way better than other people? Because whenever I was naughty, Mrs. Thomas would ask me how I could be such a bad girl when she had brought me up by hand, reproachful-like. Mr. and Mrs. Thomas moved away from Bolingbroke to Marysville, and I lived with them until I was eight years old. I helped look after the Thomas children. There were four of them younger than me, and I can tell you they took a lot of looking after. Then Mr. Thomas was killed, falling under a train, and his mother offered to take Mrs. Thomas and the children, but she didn't want me. Mrs. Thomas was at her wit's end, so she said, what to do with me? Then Mrs. Hammond from up the river came down and said she'd take me, seeing I was handy with children, and I went up the river to live with her in a little clearing among the stumps. It was a very lonesome place. I'm sure I could never have lived there if I hadn't had an imagination. Mr. Hammond worked a little sawmill up there, and Mrs. Hammond had eight children. She had twins three times. I like babies in moderation, but twins three times in succession is too much. I told Mrs. Hammond so firmly when the last pair came. I used to get so dreadfully tired carrying them about. I lived upriver with Mrs. Hammond over two years, and then Mr. Hammond died, and Mrs. Hammond broke up housekeeping. She divided her children among her relatives and went to the States. I had to go to the asylum at Hopeton because nobody would take me. They didn't want me at the asylum either. They said they were overcrowded as it was, but they had to take me, and I was there four months until Mrs. Spencer came and finished up with another sigh of relief this time. Evidently, she did not like talking about her experiences in a world that had not wanted her. Did you ever go to school? demanded Marilla, turning the sorrel mare down the shore road. Not a great deal. I went a little the last year I stayed with Mrs. Thomas. When I went up river, we were so far from a school that I couldn't walk it in winter, and there was a vacation in summer, so I could only go in the spring and fall. But of course I went while I was at the asylum. I can read pretty well, and I know ever so many pieces of poetry off by heart, and most of the seasons by James by heart, the Battle of Holinden and Ed Edinburgh after Flodden and Bingen on the, Bra on the Rhine and lots of the Lady of the Lake and most of the seasons by James Thompson. Don't you just love poetry that gives you a crinkly feeling up and down your back? There is a piece in the fifth reader, The Downfall of Poland, that is just full of thrills. Of course, I wasn't in the fifth reader, I was only in the fourth, but the big girls used to lend me theirs to read. Were those women, uh, Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. Han Hammond, good to you? asked Marilla, looking at Anne out of the corner of her eye. Oh, faltered Anne, her sensitive little face suddenly flushed scarlet and embarrassment sat on her brow. Oh, they meant to be, I know they meant to be just as good and kind as possible. And when people mean to be good to you, you don't mind very much when they're not quite always. They had a good deal to worry them, you know. It's very trying to have a drunken husband, you see, and it must be very trying to have twins three times in succession, don't you think? But I feel sure they meant to be good to me. Marilla asked no more questions. Anne gave herself up to a silent rapture over the shore road, and Marilla guided the sorrel abstractedly while she pondered deeply. Pity was suddenly stirring in her heart for the child. What a starved, unloved life she had had, a life of drudgery and poverty and neglect, for Marilla was shrewd enough to read between the lines of Anne's history and divine the truth. 
No wonder she had been so delighted at the prospect of a real home. It was a pity she had to be sent back. What if she, Marilla, should indulge Matthew's unaccountable whim and let her stay? He was set on it, and the child seemed a nice, teachable little thing. She's got too much to say, thought Marilla, but she might be trained out of that, and there's nothing rude or slangy in what she does say. She's ladylike. It's likely her people were nice folks. The shore road was woodsy and wild and lonesome. On the right hand, scrub firs, their spirits quite unbroken by long years of tussle with the gulf winds grew thickly. On the left were the deep red sandstone cliffs, so near the track in places that a mare of less steadiness than the sorrel might have tried the nerves of the people behind her. Down at the base of the cliffs were heaps of surf-worn rocks or little sandy coves, inlaid with pebbles as with ocean jewels. Beyond lay the sea, shimmering and blue, and over it soared the gulls, their, pi their pinions flashing silvery in the sunlight. Isn't the sea wonderful, said Anne, rousing from a long, wide-eyed silence. Once, when I lived in Marysville, Mr. Thomas hired an express wagon and took us all to spend the day at the shore ten miles away. I enjoyed every moment of that day, even if I had to look after the children all the time. I lived it over in happy dreams for years. But this shore is nicer than the Marysville shore. Aren't those gulls splendid? Would you like to be a gull? I think I would. That is, if I couldn't be a human girl. Don't you think it would be nice to wake up at sunrise and swoop down over the water and away out over that lovely blue all day and then at night to fly back to one's nest? Oh, I can just imagine myself doing it. What big house is that just ahead, please? That's the White Sands Hotel. Mr. Kirk runs it, but the season hasn't begun yet. There are heaps of Americans come there for the summer. They think the shore is just about right. I was afraid it might be Mrs. Spencer's place, said Anne mournfully. I don't want to get there. Somehow it will seem like the end of everything. Chapter 6, Marilla Makes Up Her Mind. Ooh, an exciting chapter. Get there they did, however, in due season. Mrs. Spencer lived in a big yellow house at White Sands Cove, and she came to the door with surprise and welcome mingled on her benevolent face. Dear, dear, she exclaimed, you're the last folks I was looking for today, but I'm real glad to see you. You'll put your horse in, and how are you, Anne? I'm as well as can be expected, thank you, said Anne smilelessly. A blight seemed to have descended on her. I suppose we'll stay a little while to rest the mare said Marilla, but I promised Matthew I'd be home early. The fact is, Mrs. Spencer, there's been a queer mistake somewhere, and I've come over to see where it is. We sent word, Matthew and I, for you to bring us a boy from the asylum. We told your brother Robert to tell you we wanted a boy ten or eleven years old. Marilla Cuthbert, you don't say so, said Mrs. Spencer in distress. Why, Robert sent the word down by his daughter Nancy and said you wanted a girl, uh, didn't she, Flora Jane? appealing to her daughter who had come out to the steps. She certainly did, Miss Cuthbert, corroborated Flora Jane earnestly. I'm dreadfully sorry, said Miss, Mrs. Spencer. It is too bad, but it certainly wasn't my fault, you see, Miss Cuthbert. I did the best I could, and I thought I was following your instructions. Nancy is a terrible flighty thing. I've often had to scold her well for her heedlessness. It was our own fault, said Marilla resignedly. We should have come to you ourselves and not left an important message to be passed along by word of mouth in that fashion. Anyhow, the mistake has been made, and the only thing to do now is to set it right. Can we send the child back to the asylum? I suppose they'll take her back, won't they? I suppose so, said Mrs. Spencer thoughtfully. But I don't think it will, necessarily, it will be necessary to send her back. Mrs. Peter Blewett was up here yesterday, and she, she was saying to me how much she wished she'd sent by me for a little girl to help her. Mrs. Peter has a large family, you know, and she finds it hard to get help. Anne will be the very girl for her. I call it positively providential. Marilla did not look as if she thought Providence had much to do with the matter. Here was an unexpectedly good chance to get this unwelcome orphan off her hands, and she did not even feel grateful for it. She knew Mrs. Peter Blewett only by sight as a small, shrewish-faced woman without an ounce of superfluous flesh on her bones. 
but she had heard of her. A terrible worker and driver, Mrs. Peter was said to be, and discharged servant girls told fearsome tales of her temper and stinginess and her family of pert quarrelsome children. Marilla felt a qualm of conscience at the thought of handing Anne over to her tender mercies. Well, I'll go in and we'll talk the matter over, she said. And if there isn't Mrs. Peter coming up the lane this blessed minute, exclaimed Mrs. Spencer, bustling her guests through the hall into the parlor, where a deadly chill struck on them as if the air had been strained so long through dark green, closely drawn blinds that it had lost every particle of warmth it had ever possessed. This is a real lucky, this is real lucky, for we can settle the matter right away. Take the armchair, Miss Cuthbert, and you sit there on the ottoman and don't wriggle. Let me take your hats. Flora Jane, go out and put the kettle on. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blewett. We were just saying how fortunate it was you happened along. Uh, let me introduce you two ladies, Mrs. Blewett, Miss Cuthbert. Uh, please excuse me for just a moment. I forgot to tell Flora Jane to take the buns out of the oven. Mrs. Spencer whisked away after pulling up the blinds. Anne, sitting mutely on the ottoman, with her hands clasped tightly in her lap, stared at Mrs. Blewett as one fascinated. Was she to be given into the keeping of this sharp-faced, sharp-eyed woman? She felt a lump coming up in her throat and her eyes smartly, smarted painfully. She was beginning to be afraid she wouldn't keep the tears back when Mrs. Spencer returned, flushed and beaming, quite capable of taking any and every difficulty, physical, mental, or spiritual, into consideration and settling it out of hand. It seems there's been a mistake about this little girl, Mrs. Blewett, she said. I was under the impression that Mr. and Miss Cuthbert wanted a little girl to adopt. I was certainly told so. But it seems it was a boy they wanted. So if you're still of the same mind you were yesterday, I think she'll be just the thing for you. Mrs. Blewett darted her eyes over Anne from head to foot. How old are you and what's your name? she demanded. Anne Shirley, faltered the shrinking child, not daring to make any stipulations regarding the spelling of thereof, and I'm eleven years old. Huh. You don't look as if there, there was much to you, but you're wiry. I don't know, but the wiry ones are the best after all. Well, if I take you, you'll have to be a good girl, you know, good and smart and respectful. I'll expect you to earn your keep, and no mistake about that. Yes, I suppose I might as well take her off your hands, Miss Cuthbert. The baby's awful fractious, and I'm clean worn out attending to him. If you like, I can take her right home now. Marilla looked at Anne and softened at the side of the child's pale face with its look of mute misery, the misery of a helpless little creature who finds itself once more caught in the trap from which it had escaped. Marilla felt an uncomfortable conviction that if she denied the appeal of that look, it would haunt her to her dying day. Moreover, she did not fancy Mrs. Blewett. To hand a sensitive, high-strung child over to such a woman, no, she could not take the responsibility of doing that. Well, I don't know, she said slowly. I didn't say that Matthew and I had absolutely decided we wouldn't keep her. In fact, I may say that Matthew is disposed to keep her. I just came over to find out how the mistake had occurred. I think I'd better take her home again and talk it over with Matthew. I feel that I oughtn't to decide on anything without consulting him. If we make up our mind not to keep her, we'll bring her or send her over to you tomorrow night. If we don't, you may know that she is going to stay with us. Will that suit you, Mrs. Blewett? I suppose it'll have to, said Mrs. Blewett ungraciously. During Marilla's speech, a surprise had been dawning on Anne's face. First, the look of despair faded out. Then came a faint flush of hope. Her eyes grew deep and bright as morning stars. The child was quite transfigured, and a moment later, when Mrs. Spencer and Mrs. Blewett went out in quest of a recipe the latter had come to borrow, she sprang up and flew across the room to Marilla. Oh, Miss Cuthbert, did you really say that perhaps you would let me stay at Green Gables? She said in a breathless whisper, as if speaking aloud might shatter the glorious possibility. Did you really say it, or did I only imagine that you did? I think you'd better learn to control that imagination of yours, Anne, if you can't distinguish between what is real and what isn't, said Marilla crossly. Yes, you did hear me say just that and no more. It isn't decided yet, and perhaps we will conclude to let Mrs. Blewett take you after all. She certainly needs you much more than I do. 
I'd rather go back to the asylum than go live with her, said Anne passionately. She looks exactly like a, like a gimlet. Marilla smothered a smile under the conviction that Anne must be reproved for such a speech. A little girl like you should be ashamed of talking so about a lady and a stranger, she said severely. Go back and sit down quietly and hold your tongue and behave as a good girl should. I'll try to do and be anything you want me, if only you'll keep me, said Anne, returning meekly to her ottoman. When they arrived back at Green Gables that evening, Matthew met them in the lane. Marilla from afar had noted him prowling along it and guessed his motive. She was prepared for the relief she had in his face when he saw that she had at least brought Anne back with her. But she said nothing to him relative to the affair until they were both out in the yard behind the barn milking the cows. Then she briefly told him Anne's history and the result of the interview with Mrs. Spencer. I wouldn't give a dog I liked to that bluet woman, said Matthew with unusual vim. <laughs> I, don't fa fancy her style my I don't fancy her style myself, admitted Marilla. But it's that or keeping her ourselves, Matthew. And since you seem to want her, I suppose I'm willing or have to be. I've been thinking over the idea until I've got kind of used to it. It seems a sort of duty. I've never brought up a child, especially a girl, and I dare say I'll make a terrible mess of it, but I'll do my best. So far as I'm concerned, Matthew, she may stay. Matthew's shy face was a glow of delight. Well, now, I reckon you'd come to see it in that light, Marilla, he said. She's such an interesting little thing. It'd be more to the point if you could say she was a useful little thing, retorted Marilla. But I'll make it my business to see she's trained to be that. And mind, Matthew, you're not going to go interfering with my methods. Perhaps an old maid doesn't know much about bringing up a child, but I guess she knows more than an old bachelor. So you just leave me to manage her. When I fail, it'll be time enough to put your oar in. There, there, Marilla, you can have your own way, said Matthew reassuringly. Only be as good and kind to her as you can be without spoiling her. I kind of think she's one of the sort you can do anything with if only you get her to love you. Marilla sniffed to express her contempt for Matthew's opinions concerning anything feminine and walked off to the dairy with the pails. I won't let her, I won't tell her tonight that she can stay, she reflected as she strained the milk from into the creamers. She'd be so excited that she wouldn't sleep a wink. Marilla Cuthbert, you're fairly in for it. Did you ever suppose you'd see the day when you'd be adopting an orphan girl? It's surprising enough, but not so surprising as that Matthew should be at the bottom of it. Him, that always seemed to have such a mortal dread of little girls. Anyhow, we've decided on the experiment, and goodness only knows what will come of it. Yay! <laughs> That's so cute. I really like how, I mean... As a reader, we can probably guess that Anne was going to stay somehow, but the real fun of the way that the story is being told is, is the how. And, you know, it could have been the, the case that Marilla simply had a change of heart um, from Anne's story or, or history, but I really love how it sort of compounds on Marilla and then she gets into this corner. Uh, there's a lot of urgency and the stakes are high when... Um, Mrs. Blewett might be taking Anne for herself. So it's a very, very human part of Marilla. I like to see someone who has been sort of, um, I don't know, not necessarily cold, but certainly not uh, overwhelmingly uh, blooming with positivity and love and, <laughs> and, and, and passion and, and everything. So to see her have these, uh, a turn of heart in that way, when in a, in a kind of funny circumstance, um, when, she, when she's like, oh, well, you know, we, we haven't decided yet. <laughs> so I, I really like that part. I'm very glad that Anne gets to stay. So we'll probably uh, finish up with this chapter. We'll see how far we get until the end of the hour. But um, what an exciting point of the story to get to today. So this is chapter seven. Anne says her prayers. When Marilla took Anne up to bed that night, she said stiffly, Now, Anne, I noticed last night that you threw your clothes all about the floor when you took them off. That is a very untidy habit, and I can't allow it at all. As soon as you take off any article of clothing, fold it neatly and place it on the chair. I haven't any use at all for little girls who aren't neat. 
I was so har harrowed up in my mind last night that I didn't think about my clothes at all, said Anne. I'll fold them nicely tonight. They always made us do that at the asylum. Half the time, though, I'd forget. I'd be in such a hurry to get into bed nice and quiet and imagine things. You'll have to remember a little better if you are to stay here, admonished Marilla. There, that looks something like, say your prayers now and get into bed. I never say any prayers, announced Anne. Marilla looked horrified, astonished, looked in horrified astonishment. Why, Anne, what do you mean? Were you never taught to say your prayers? God always wants little girls to say their prayers. Don't you know who God is, Anne? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, responded Anne promptly and glibly. Marilla looked rather relieved. So you do know something, then, thank goodness. You're not quite a heathen. Where did you learn that? Oh, at the Asylum Sunday School. They made us learn the whole catechism. I liked it pretty well. There's something splendid about some of the words. Infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Isn't that grand? It has such a roll to it, just like a big organ playing. You couldn't quite call it poetry, I suppose, but it sounds a lot like it, doesn't it? We're not talking about poetry, Anne. We are talking about saying your prayers. Don't you know it's a terrible, wicked thing not to say your prayers every night? I'm afraid you are a very bad little girl. You'll find it easier to be bad than good if you had red hair, said Anne reproachfully. People who haven't red hair don't know what trouble it is. Mrs. Thomas told me that God made my hair red on purpose, and I've never cared about him since. And anyhow, I'd always be too tired at night to bother saying prayers. People who have to look after twins can't be expected to say their prayers. Now, do you honestly think they can? Marilla decided that Anne's religious training must be, must be begun at once. Plainly, there was no time to be lost. You must say your prayers while you are under my roof, Anne. Oh, why, of course, if you want me to, assented Anne cheerfully. I'd do anything to oblige you, but you'll have to tell me what to say for this once. After I get into bed, I'll imagine out a real nice prayer to say always. I believe that it will be quite interesting now that I come to think of it. You must kneel down, said Marilla in embarrassment. Anne knelt at Marilla's knee and looked up gravely. Why must people kneel down to pray? If I really wanted to pray, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd go out into a big field all alone or into the deep, deep woods, and I'd look up into the sky, up, up, up into the lovely blue sky that looks as if there was no end to its blueness, and then I'd just feel a prayer when I'm ready. Uh, well, I'm ready. What am I to say? Marilla felt more embarrassed than ever. She had intended to teach Anne the childish classic, Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep. But she had, as I have told you, the glimmerings of a sense of humor, which is simply another name for a sense of the fitness of things. And it suddenly occurred to her that the simple little prayer, sacred to a white-robed white childhood lisping at motherly knees, was entirely unsuited to this freckled witch of a girl who knew and cared nothing about God's love, since she had never had it translated to her through the medium of human love. You're old enough to say, to pray for yourself, Anne, she said finally. Just thank God for your blessings and ask him humbly for the things you want. Well, I'll do my best, promised Anne, burying her face in Marilla's lap. Gracious Heavenly Father, that's the way the ministers say it in church, so I suppose it's all right in a private prayer, isn't it? She interjected, lifting her head for a moment. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank thee for the white way of delight and the lake of shining waters and Bonnie and the Snow Queen. I'm really extremely grateful for them. And that's all the blessings I can think of just now to thank thee for. As for the things I want, they're so numerous that it would take a great deal of time to name them all, so I will only mention the two most important. Please let me stay at Green Gables, and please let me be good-looking when I grow up. I remain. <laughs> there, d there, did I do all right? She asked. Get uh, I remain yours respectfully, and Shirley. <laughs> there, did I do it all right? She asked, eagerly getting up. I could have made it much more flowery if I'd had a little more time to think it over. 
poor Marilla was only preserved from co complete collapse by remembering that it was not irreverence but simply spiritual ignorance on the part of Anne that was responsible for this extraordinary petition. She tucked the child up in bed, mentally vowing that she had that she should be taught a prayer the very next day and was leaving the room with the light when Anne called her back. I've just thought of it now. I should have said amen in place of yours respectfully, shouldn't I? Shouldn't I? The way the ministers do, I'd forgotten it. But I felt a prayer should be finished off in some way, so I put in the other. Do you suppose it will make any difference? I, I don't suppose it will, said Marilla. Go to sleep now like a good child. Good night. I can say good night tonight with a clear conscience, said Anne, cuddling luxuriously down among her pillows. Marilla retreated to the kitchen, set the candle firmly on the table, and glared at Matthew. Matthew Cuthbert, it's about time somebody adopted that child and taught her something. She's next door to a perfect heathen. Will you believe that she never said a prayer in her life till tonight? I'll send to the manse tomorrow and borrow the peep of day series that's what i'll do and she shall go to sunday school just as soon as i can get some suitable clothes made for her i foresee that i shall have my hands full well well we can't get through this world without our share of trouble i've had a pretty easy life of it so far but my time has come at last and i suppose i'll just have to make the best of it all right let's continue <laughs> I really liked her, the prayer ending and respectfully yours. Oh, that's, it's very innocent, very funny, and very cute. Oh, and what a sweet moment when she's so thankful or, or what she wants is to just stay at Green Gables. That's such a sweet moment. And then it's funny when she wants her, uh, her uh, second wish is to become beautiful. <laughs> so something a little, um, perhaps a little shallow, but... She is a young girl. <laughs> so here we go. We have chapter eight. Anne's bringing up is begun. For reasons best known to herself, Marilla did not tell Anne that she was going to stay at Green Gables until the next afternoon. During the forenoon, she kept the child busy with various tasks and watched over her with a keen eye while she did them. By noon, she had concluded that Anne was smart and obedient, willing to work and quick to learn. Her most serious shortcoming seemed to be a tendency to fall into daydreams in the middle of a task and forget all about it until such time as she was sharply recalled to earth by a reprimand or a catastrophe. When Anne had finished washing the dinner dishes, she suddenly confronted Marilla with the air and expression of one desperately determined to learn the worst. Her thin little body trembled from head to foot, her face flushed and her eyes dilated until they were almost black. She clasped her hands tightly and said in an imploring voice, Oh, please, Miss Cuthbert, won't you tell me if you are going to send me away or not? I've tried to be patient all, all the morning, but I really feel that I cannot bear not knowing any longer. It's a dreadful feeling. Please tell me. You haven't scalded the dishcloth and cleaned hot water as I told you to do, said Marilla immovably. Just go and do it before you ask any more questions, Anne. Anne went and attended to the dishcloth. Then she returned to Marilla and fastened imploring eyes on the latter's face. Well, said Marilla, unable to find any excuse for deferring her explanation longer. I suppose I might as well tell you. Matthew and I have decided to keep you. That is, if you are, if you will, try to be a good little girl and show yourself grateful. Why, child, whatever is the matter? I'm crying, said Anne in a tone of be bewilderment. I can't think why. I'm as glad as can be. Oh, glad doesn't seem the right word at all. I was glad about the white way and the cherry blossoms, but this, oh, it's something more than glad. I'm so happy. I'll try to be so good. It will be uphill work, I expect, for Mrs. Thomas often told me I was desperately wicked. However, I'll do my very best. But can you tell me why I'm crying? I suppose it's because you're excited and all worked up, said Marilla disapprovingly. Sit down on that chair and try to calm yourself. I'm afraid you both cry and laugh far too easily. Yes, you can stay here and we will try to do right by you. You must go to school, but it's only a fortnight till vacation, so it isn't worthwhile for you to start before it opens again in September. What am I to call you? asked Anne. Shall I always say Miss Cuthbert? Can I call you Aunt Marilla? 
No, you'll call me just plain Marilla. I'm not used to be calling, being called Miss Cuthbert, and it would make me nervous. It sounds awfully disrespectful to just say Marilla, protested Anne. I guess there'll be nothing disrespectful in it if you're careful to speak respectfully. Everybody, young and old, in Avonlea calls me Marilla, except the minister. He says Miss Cuthbert when he thinks of it. I'd love to call you Aunt Marilla, said Anne wistfully. I've never had an aunt or any relation at all, not even a grandmother. It would, be, it would make me feel as if I really belonged to you. Can't I call you Aunt Marilla? No, I'm not your aunt, and I don't believe in calling people names that don't belong to them. But we could imagine you were my aunt. I couldn't, said Marilla grimly. Do you never imagine things different from what they really are? Asked Anne wide-eyed. No. Oh, Anne drew a long breath. Oh, Miss uh, Marilla, how much you miss. I don't believe in imagining things different from what they really are, retorted Marilla. When the Lord puts us in certain circumstances, he doesn't mean for us to imagine them away. And that reminds me, uh, go into the sitting room, Anne, be sure your feet are clean and don't let any flies in, and bring out the illustrated card that's on the mantelpiece. The Lord's Prayer is on it, and you'll devote your spare time this afternoon to learning it off by heart. There's to be no more of such praying as I heard last night. I suppose I was very awkward, said Anne apologetically. But then, let's see, I, do, 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 sorry. Oh, where are we? Oh, there we are. <laughs> I suppose I was very awkward, said Anne apologetically. But then you see, I've I had never had any practice. You couldn't really expect a person to pray very well the first time she tried, could you? I thought out a splendid prayer after I went to bed, just as I promised you I would. It was nearly as long as a minister's and so poetical. But would you believe it? I couldn't remember one word when I woke up this morning. And I'm afraid I'll never be able to think out another one as good. Somehow, things never are so good when they're thought out a second time. Have you ever noticed that? Here is something for you to notice, Anne. When I tell you to do a thing, I want you to obey me at once and not stand stock still and discourse about it. Just you go and do as I bid you. Anne promptly departed for the sitting room across the hall. She failed to return after waiting ten minutes. Marilla laid down her knitting and marched after her with a grim expression. She found Anne standing motionless before a picture hanging on the wall between the two windows, with her hands clasped clasp behind her, her face uplifted, and her eyes astare with dreams. The white and green light strained through apple trees and clustering vines outside fell over the rapt little figure with a half-unearthly radiance. Anne, whatever are you thinking of? demanded Marilla sharply. Anne came back to earth with a start. That, she said, pointing to the picture, a rather vivid chromo entitled Christ Blessing Little Children. And I was just imagining I was one of them, that I was a little girl in the blue dress, standing off by herself in the corner as if she didn't belong to anybody, like me. She looks so lonely and sad, don't you think? I guess she hadn't any father or mother of her own, but she wanted to be blessed too, so she just crept shyly up on the outside of the crowd, hoping nobody would notice her, except him. I'm sure I know just how she felt. Her heart must have beat and her hands must have got cold like mine did when I asked you if I could stay. She was afraid he mightn't notice her. But it's likely he did, don't you think? I've been trying to imagine it all out. Her edging a little nearer all the time until she was quite close to him. And then he would look at her and put his hand on her hair and, oh, such a thrill of joy as would run over her. But I wish the artist hadn't painted him so sorrowful looking. All his pictures are like that, if you've noticed. But I don't believe he could really have looked so sad or the children would have been afraid of him. Anne, said Marilla, wondering why she had not broken into the speech long before, you shouldn't talk that way. It's irreverent, positively irreverent. Oh, ir irreverent, yes. <laughs> Anne's eyes marveled. Why, I felt just as reverent as could be. I'm sure I didn't mean it to be irreverent. Well, I don't suppose you did, but it doesn't sound right to talk so familiarly about such things. And another thing, Anne, when I send you after something, you're to bring it at once and not fall into mooning and imagining before pictures. Remember that. Take that card and come right to the kitchen. Now sit in the corner and learn that prayer off by heart. 
and set the card up against the jug full of apple blossoms she had brought in to decorate the dinner table. Marilla had eyed that decoration askance, but said nothing, propped her chin on her hands and fell to studying it intently for several silent minutes. I like this, she announced at length. It's beautiful. I've heard it before. I heard the superintendent of the asylum Sunday school say it over once, but I didn't like it then. He had such a cracked voice and he prayed so mournfully. I really felt sure he thought praying was a disagreeable duty. This isn't poetry, but it makes me feel just the same way poetry does. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is just like a line of music. Oh, I'm so glad you thought of making me learn this, Miss <clears throat> Marilla. Well, learn it and hold your tongue, said Marilla shortly. And tipped the, the vase of apple blossoms near enough to bestow a soft kiss on a pink cupped bud and then studied diligently for some moments longer. Marilla, she demanded presently, do you think I shall ever have a, a bosom friend in Avonlea? Uh, a what kind of friend? A bosom friend, an intimate friend, you know, a, a really kindred spirit to whom I can confide my inmost soul. I've dreamed of meeting her all my life. I never really supposed I would, but so many of my loveliest dreams have come true all at once that perhaps this one will, too. Do you think it's possible? Diana Berry lives over at Orchard Slope, and she's about your age. She's a very nice little girl, and perhaps she will be a playmate for you when she comes home. She's visiting her aunt over at Carmody just now. You'll have to be careful how you behave yourself, though. Mrs. Barry is a very particular woman. She won't let Diana play with any little girl who isn't nice and good. Anne looked at Marilla through the apple blossoms, her eyes aglow with interest. What is Diana like? Her hair isn't red, is it? Oh, I hope not. It's bad enough to have red hair myself, but I positively couldn't endure it in a bosom friend. Diana is a very pretty little girl. She has black eyes and hair and rosy cheeks, and she is good and smart, which is better than being pretty. Marilla was as fond of morals as the Duchess of Wonderland and was firmly convinced that one, sh one should be tacked on to every remark made to a child who was being brought up. But Anne waved the moral inconse inconsequently aside and seized only on that delightful possibilities before it. Oh, I'm so glad she's pretty. Next to being beautiful oneself, and that's important, impossible in my case, it would be best to have a beautiful bosom, bosom friend. When I lived with Mrs. Thomas, she had a bookcase in her sitting room with glass doors. There weren't any books in it. Mrs. Thomas kept her best china and her preserves there. When she had any preserves to keep, one of the doors was broken. And Mrs. Mr. Thomas smashed it one night when he was slightly intoxicated. But the other was whole, and I used to pretend that my reflection in it was another little girl who lived in it. I called her Katie Maurice, and we were very intimate. I used to talk to her by the hour, especially on Sunday, and tell everything. Katie was the comfort and consolation of my life. We used to pretend that the bookcase was enchanted, and that if I only knew the spell, I could open the door and step right into the room where Katie Maurice lived, instead of into Mrs. Thomas's shelves of preserves and china. And then Katie Maurice would have taken me by the hand and led me out into a wonderful place, all flowers and sunshines and fairies, and we would have lived happily forever after. When I went to live with Mrs. Hammond, it just broke my heart to leave Katie Maurice. She felt it dreadfully too, I know she did, for she was crying when she kissed me goodbye through the bookcase door. There was no bookcase at Mrs. Hammond's, but just up the river a little way from the house, there was a long green little valley, and the loveliest echo lived there. It echoed back every word you said, even if you didn't talk a bit loud. So I imagined that it was a little girl called Va Violetta, and we were great friends and I loved her almost as well as I loved Katie Maurice. Not quite, but almost, you know. The night before I went to the asylum, I said goodbye to Violetta. And, oh, her goodbye came to me in such a sad, sad tone. I had become so attached to her that I hadn't the heart to imagine a bosom friend at the asylum, even if there had been any scope for imagination there. I think it's just as well there wasn't, said Marilla dryly. I don't approve of such goings-on. You seem to half believe your own imaginations. It will be well for you to have a real live friend to put such nonsense out of your head. 
but don't let Mrs. Barry hear you talking about your Katie Maurice's and your Violetta's, or she'll think you're telling stories. Oh, I won't. I couldn't talk of them to everybody. Their memories are too sacred for that, but I thought I'd like to have you know about them. Oh, look, here's a big bee just tumbled out of an apple blossom. Just think what a lovely place to live in an apple blossom. Fancy going to sleep in it when the wind was rocking it. If I wasn't a human girl, I think I'd like to be a bee and live among the flowers. Yesterday you wanted to be a seagull, sniffed Marilla. I thought you were a very fickle, I, I thought you, you were very, I think you were very fickle minded. I told you to learn that prayer and not talk, but it seems impossible for you to stop talking if you've got anybody that will listen to you. So go up to your room and learn it. Oh, I know it pretty nearly all now, all but just the last line. Well, never mind, do as I tell you. Go to your room and finish learning it well and stay there until I call you down to help me get tea. Can I take the apple blossoms with me for company? Pleaded Anne. No, you don't want your room cluttered up with flowers. You should have left them on the tree in the first place. I did feel a little, a little that way too, said Anne. I kind of felt I shouldn't shorten their lovely lives by picking them. I wouldn't want to be picked if I were an apple blossom, but the temptation was irresistible. What do you do uh, when you meet with an irresistible temptation? Anne, did you hear me tell you go to your room? Anne sighed, retreated to the east gable, and sat down in a chair by the window. We will have to end it there today. But what, a, what an exciting part that we've gotten to. So Anne gets to stay with uh, the Cuthberts. And I can already see that a really uh, nice relationship between Marilla and Anne is starting. And um, I'm excited to see how the relationship with Matthew and Anne is going to bloom as well. And um, so we will, we will continue this wonderful story tomorrow at noon. Thank you so much for joining me today. And as always, um, if you can show your appreciation with some financial support, you can donate to us at uh, www.negahc.org. And um, other ways that you can support us are, of course, by leaving a review for us, either on our Facebook page, our Google listing, and of course, simply tell your friends and family about us. We have awesome live streams every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And of course, I'll be continuing reading uh, Anne of Green Gables weekdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, but we really appreciate all the support that y'all have shown us already. It's really cool to have people from all over the country joining us. So until tomorrow, please stay happy, please stay healthy and well, and I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.